Hello everybody. Welcome to Facebook Live and New Hampshire Audubon Ask a Naturalist. Stay tuned as a few more people begin to join and I'm going to start in a few minutes. Please feel free to chime in with any of your questions right now. anybody is on right now just give me a, a quick comment if you could just let me know how things are looking and working that would be much appreciated welcome to those who are joining in now Is everybody able to hear me okay? Okay. Thank you, Susan, for chiming in and the others for joining. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We have a few comments coming in and questions. Great. Please keep them coming in. We can use a few questions for today. Um, Vicki asking about pine siskins. Great. Yeah, we'll be talking about pine siskins and other winter finches really shortly. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, we have a, a lot of content coming in um, uh, through the New Hampshire Audubon Facebook page and other forms of social media, our YouTube page. So thanks to those who have been following along. And for those who are just joining here, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. It's 10 o'clock right now. And uh, I will get going shortly. So yeah, any comments or questions, please start to add them right now to the feed. And uh, I can try to get to some of those later. Is the volume okay? People can hear me all right? All right, why don't we get going? Um, so good morning, everybody. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm Phil Brown with New Hampshire Audubon. I'm the director of land management for the organization. And for the second week in a row, I'm filling in for Becky Swamla. So uh, Becky's out, but she'll be back in early December uh, when our segment continues. Next Thursday, we're going to be taking the week off to do a... Uh, a certain type of bird survey on Thursday. What bird do you suppose that might be? Here's a hint. It's Thanksgiving. I think I think you all will get this one, so I'll, I'll avoid being too cheesy about it. Uh, we will be uh, focused on wild turkeys. Um, so there won't be a program next week, but we'll get back to it the first Thursday in December. Uh, but, yeah, why not start by talking about turkeys a little bit? Um, feel free to send in your turkey questions, gobble gobble. Uh, thank you, Vicki. Uh, any comments or, or thoughts about turkeys that you might have, send them my way. I can't claim to be a turkey expert per se, but um, I do get to interact with them quite a bit in my own backyard. And we just saw a large uh, flock come through yesterday. Um, but a little bit of history about wild turkeys to get going. Um, we will... Uh, You'll know about the Native American tradition with, with turkey and the Thanksgiving uh, holiday, of course. But um, in New Hampshire, locally, um, these, this species was effectively eliminated from the state 
in the mid 1850s so a long time ago turkeys disappeared and um, they they were lost because we were clearing land at a rapid pace um, for farming uh, there was also unregulated hunting going on mostly for for subsistence for people's own meals um, but we lost a lot of turkeys at that point and turkeys were extirpated which is a local form of, of um, extinction so extirpated from New Hampshire in the mid 1850s so fast forward a hundred years and in 1975 25 turkeys one little band of 25 turkeys was released into southwestern New Hampshire and look at this 45 years later there are now over 40,000 turkeys according to New Hampshire Fish and Game in New Hampshire so pretty impressive species recovery and restoration it uh, it wasn't hard for turkeys to just take off and start eating all the bountiful food that was that was here um, so let me get to a few of these questions in a second but just uh, a little bit more about turkeys um, they have they have some negative consequences but also a lot of positive ones um, uh, most of the negative consequences have to do with people's perceptions of them a lot of people um, don't actually enjoy being around these large animals that are defecating everywhere and roosting in strange places but they're pretty fascinating and they're um, they're they're all over the place now they feed a lot of large mammals too and um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those large mammals later on uh, but they're roving through the woods right now late November in search of the bountiful acorns that have been dropped by uh, by oak trees this is a big mast year in the state so there's plenty for turkeys to eat um, as well as other foods but um, but acorns are a primary source they're fun to watch you could get them at your bird feeders if you throw a little cracked corn on the ground especially but they'll come to other seeds as well and uh, it's fun watching them especially in the evening as they they fly up into uh, roosting sites where they sleep at um, in large pine trees mostly so okay um, I'll get to a question here about barn owls I see there was a question from Susan about the barn owls um, we do have a, a captive um, ambassador bird a barn owl um, that was raised from uh, an early age from when it was a chick at New Hampshire Audubon at the McLean Center and um, the owl is not very hardy this bird is a southern species barn owls don't regularly occur in northern New England um, they're very rare when they show up in New Hampshire it's it's very odd occurrence so mostly they're they're a southern species they don't do well in the winter um, we have a winter muse set up for the owl indoors so that's probably why you're not seeing it if you take a walk at the McLean Center now we do have some live ambassador birds that you can see by walking behind the center and, and through a little winterized area um, bald eagle red-tailed hawk um, those two come to mind as being there so um, and barred owls also um, so yeah thanks for sending in that question some other questions are coming in about pine siskins about dark-eyed juncos I'll get to those in a minute but uh, I'll talk a little bit about where I am here this morning um, I'm at my home in Hancock New Hampshire in the southwestern part of the state the Monadnock region and I'm glancing out the window occasionally as I do um, and you know now that it's late November we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the natural world now uh, last week I talked about deer hunting season um, it's uh, I have my blaze orange vest here as a reminder so please keep that around you if you go out in the woods and fields and wetlands um, deer hunting season will go until December 6th in most parts of the state and a little beyond that in far northern New Hampshire so be aware when you're outside um, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some backyard mammals today some bird feeder activity including I promise this time a closer look at my own feeder setup so we'll take a look outside and see what's going on so stay tuned for some maybe some live bird footage too uh, I'll talk about window protection for uh, window strikes and um, what's going on with the winter finches the hawk migration 
and a little bit about some New Hampshire Audubon wildlife sanctuaries, which is my area of expertise in the organization and my role as uh, the director of land management. So, um, but as usual, I'm taking questions from all of you. Uh, so thanks to those who've submitted questions already. Um, please keep those coming. We'll have some time to get to those in the next 20 minutes or so. <clears throat> and hopefully we have no technology issues again today. So far, so good. Let me know if at any point you can't hear or see me. Thank you. Um, so unlike the previous week, this week has started with a little blast of cold weather and uh, a little bit more seasonable weather, too. It's, it's not a bad thing at all to have this kind of weather happen at this time of the year. This is what should be happening. Um, however, we know the weather has gotten more erratic over the years, and we've had several falls over the, of the past bunch of years that I can remember around here that have been just far too warm in many ways, and, uh, you know, not a bad thing for getting us outside and interacting in the only way we can really safely right now. So we've enjoyed these warmer spells, but really it's good to get back to this colder weather for, um, for the sake of the wildlife and the native plants that are around us here. Um, so not a bad thing at all. And with these colder, strong cold fronts from the Arctic, bringing Arctic air, maybe we're starting to see some northern visitors come into our, our uh, area, such as um, uh, some of the birds from the high Arctic. So I'd love to see if anybody here has been catching up with any of those northern visitors. <clears throat> um, so last week I talked about some of the invertebrates that were still around, dragonflies, um, moths, bees and wasps. Um, that's not so much an issue this morning. <laughs> it was about 15 degrees when I woke up this morning. Um, but, uh, but I have to say, it's never a bad time to get outside, bundle up and get out there, and you will be rewarded, um, I promise you, if you make the effort and um, take a walk in the same place, get familiar with what's around you, wherever you are. So um, this morning I had one of those experiences. I was walking up the driveway with my cup of coffee in hand to keep my hands warm, um, like I do just about every morning, and... Uh, have a look around to see what what birds were around me and uh, I was starting to hear some uh, some interesting calls we've, we've had a, a slew of crossbills this year so it's not unusual in my backyard this fall to have red crossbills around this is a northern finch that I think I may have shown a picture of last week um, and uh, they have a, a bill that that actually crosses like that so they're designed to extract seeds from white pines and other types of uh, conifers like spruces and that's what their what their diet is pretty much exclusively uh, so crossbills were calling chattering away but they were chattering in a slightly different way it caught my attention and I looked up and, and I saw a large bird kind of slowly flying in and I was immediately figuring it, it was a raptor um, we've had sharp shinned and cooper's hawks in the yards um, in the in the past weeks, so I figured it was one of those, but this bird had long angled wings uh, and it, uh, it started to speed up and suddenly, as the warning calls started to escalate, I saw and heard this bird snatch one of the crossbills right off of the top of a white pine tree up my driveway. Um, it was a merlin, it was a large female merlin, uh, which is a medium-sized falcon that mostly passes through our state in the fall. and. Um, breeds here in small numbers in the summer, um, but uh, at this point in late November, it's getting a little bit late for a bird like that, but it was amazing just, just to see what was happening right before my eyes. It's not every day when you get to witness a, a bird kill, tragic as it is, but raptors have to make a living somehow, and uh, so I got to be rewarded with just an average stroll up my driveway. So I promise you do the same thing Get out there, be observant, have your binoculars on, and um, and you'll see amazing things too. So, uh, so, so get out there despite the cold weather. Um, but despite the cold weather, it's still tick season as well as hunting season. So please be vigilant, um, dress in light colors, check yourself for ticks. There could be some really small nymphs. So um, take precautions to avoid uh, getting tick bites right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about rare birds in the state. 
Um, let's see, yeah, one of them just popped up here in the feed from Susan. She got to see a snowy owl in Hampton State Beach a few days ago. That is so exciting, Susan. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, snowy owls are one of those northern visitors that I, I alluded to earlier, um, being ushered in by some of these cold fronts that happen in November. So, uh, yeah, snowy owls breed up in the high Arctic of northern Canada, mostly. And um, every winter, to some extent, snowy owls do make a push south and show up in regular places such as Plum Island, the Parker River Refuge in Massachusetts, that would be, uh, and Hampton Beach State Park in our own uh, Hampton, New Hampshire. Um, these are regular places where they occur. I saw a photo of that particular snowy owl, and it looked like it was on the beach next to um, a stump or a log or something that had washed up. Um, it was just a, a beautiful image to see something like that. So very exciting to see one of our largest uh, owls, um, uh, a rare visitor from the north. So be on the lookout. There was also one reported in the Connecticut River Valley in southwestern New Hampshire. So it's not just the coast where snowy owls might show up. Um, if you see something kind of big and white, don't always assume it's a plastic bag blowing in the wind. So take a stop and, and look at it. But a lot of the times, white birds are reported um, and, and thought to be snowy owls because of how white they appear underneath. A lot of the time, those birds end up being red-tailed hawks. So um, you'll want to take a close look at, at markings on both the, the back side and the front. Um, so snowy owls, white on the back, white on the front, with some degree of, of dark markings on the chest. That's great. Another eruptive species like that that has shown up is the rough-legged hawk, um, also an Arctic breeding raptor, uh, and it's starting to push through at this point, going to those same coastal and open field locations where they can find uh, prey similar to what they have in the high Arctic where they feed on lemmings and small mammals. Um, so let's see. Um, always remember to keep a respectful distance from these owls and raptors, which are, are rare and out of place. And uh, even if they look fairly content, don't just assume that they're happy with your presence up close. So it's important to be respectful of the owls themselves and their needs, as well as the land that, that you're on too, and the, um, the private property that you may be on at that point. So, uh, and also just a little plug to avoid any sort of crowding situations, just having to do with COVID safety right now. Uh, there's more information about these topics on our website, uh, and the New Hampshire Bird Records uh, Journal is another great place to go for that information. There is um, a, a link to um, Bird Records, which I'll, I'll post in this feed here, coming up. So for anybody who wants to go on to that, have a look. So let's talk about winter finches. Uh, these are some of the species like the crossbills that I mentioned earlier and the other eruptives like the pine siskins that some are talking about in this feed uh, that are pushing south into our state from the north and the west. Um, they're, they're being pushed here by a scarcity of food that they are used to in, in their home territories. So there's a lack of cone crops and birch crop in the north and the west this year. So it's pushing a lot of these birds south and east in large numbers. Um, things we haven't seen in several years in any number, like common red poles are coming through. Evening grosbeaks, which are cyclical and eruptive. Um, I think the last big eruption of evening grosbeaks to this extent may have been as, as uh, many as 25 years ago, some are saying. Um, but a few years ago, too, we did have an evening grosbeak push. These are attractive, large winter finches. They're like a giant goldfinch with a massive bill. So um, a very exciting bird to have at your bird feeders. Is anybody seeing them at feeders right now? I'd love to hear if you have evening grosbeaks or other winter finches. Um, we're trying to keep up with, uh, with where these birds are going and where they might be ending up um, for the winter. And they don't just stay in one place, too. They exhaust their food supply and move on in some cases. So I'm um, starting to get some hints that maybe pine siskins are moving on 
Uh, we've seen large numbers in the past month or two, but I'm starting to see a slowdown at my own feeders here uh, with that species. There are also uh, some frugivores, fruit-eating birds, that are pushing south at this time of the year. Um, pine grosbeak is a massive winter finch, like an evening grosbeak. Uh, and bohemian waxwing, which is not a finch, and is closely related to our cedar waxwings, which you're more familiar with. Uh, Bohemians are northern breeders, though. They're Canadian, and they're coming down south uh, because of the lack of, of um, a softer mast. So fruit sources like mountain ash and highbush cranberry would be um, a couple of northern shrubs that they would be feeding on. Uh, there's a lack of that kind of food up north in Canada and the northern U.S. So we may start to see them showing up. Um, so let's see, Megan chiming in with, uh, um, she thinks she saw a white-winged crossbill at Wana Lancet uh, feeding at the top of the hemlock. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds very likely that that could be the case. Um, white-winged crossbills. I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm going to put up a photo here. And this is one that I took on Tuesday. Um, where I spend every Tuesday up on top of um, Pac-Manadnock Mountain for New Hampshire Audubon and the Harris Center conducting the, the hawk watch that we do each year. So here is an image of some crossbills of the white-winged variety. This is a flock largely comprised of males with uh, reddish coloration, two white wing bars, black wings, and you can see those those interesting split bills. And sure enough, they are feeding on cones. That is the top of a red spruce tree. So very similar to um, to the hemlock in, in food source. Uh, uh, crossbills will also feed on hemlock. So yeah, Megan, it's, it's very likely that that's what you saw. Uh, the females are brownish, um, where the male would be reddish. So there was one picture there, but it was a little bit hard to see. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for them. They're pushing south through the spruce forest right now. Um, yeah, I got to see a flock of about 60 zooming all around the summit of Pac-Man And, um, and over a hundred were reported from Mount Manadnock, uh, in the same week by other birders. So, um, yeah, this is the year to see a lot of these, these rare visitors from the north. So get out there, look up at conifers. Um, especially in the high elevations, you might see white wing crossbills. But even coastal pine stands, you could find some of these crossbills pushing south into the coastal areas. Uh, and frugivores like the pine grove speak and the bohemian waxwings, you might find those in town centers in northern New Hampshire, especially right now where they're being reported. But it does sound like they might be exhausting their food sources shortly because there's not a lot of fruit. On those shrubs and trees either. So get ready in southern New Hampshire and uh, and even south of the border. So there may be more coming. Um, evening growth speaks have gotten as far as Florida and Texas this year, so they're moving south in, in huge numbers. There was a flock of 19 seen by a birder yesterday uh, here in Hancock. So be ready with your black oil sunflower ready. And, um, and if you have winter finches or want to attract them, you'll want a thistle feeder. Um, and of course, be sure to bear proof your feeders. Take them in at night, um, at least through mid-December. That's a good rule of thumb around here. And uh, keep squirrels off your feeders. It's just, it'll save you money, it'll save you a headache of dealing with uh, spilled seeds and, and chewed up feeders, <laughs> believe me. I've been through it. Um, also, let's talk a little bit about uh, feeding birds such as, um, uh, well, feeding birds water, giving food, giving birds uh, a, a fresh water source. It's a little bit hard when it's 15 degrees outside to keep water, but uh, as much as you can, try to keep uh, your bird bath filled if you have one. Um, there are fountains that are available and heaters if you want to go to that extent. I don't personally do that here, um, but this year I've seen more birds at the bird bath probably because of, of how dry things have been. So they still need that source. And a friend asked me recently, how do they keep from freezing while bathing in cold water? And I think that's a great question. 
Um, well, birds have plenty of strategies for dealing with cold temperatures. Um, they have to maintain a 106 degree body temperature uh, for most species, um, even during these cold conditions. So how do they do that? Well, they add their winter weight, just like we do, right? We have to fatten up this time of the year. Uh, some species like chickadees add up to about 10% of their body weight in fat through eating fattier foods. Um, suet and seed is a good source of fat. Uh, there are also behavioral changes that birds will use, such as taking shelter from the wind, um, huddling up together in roosting cavities at night. Chickadees and kinglets will do this in particular and stay warm by, by huddling up and taking turns and of who's going to be on the outside and who's going to be in the inside. So it's a good way to, uh, to help them survive. Um, you can put up roost boxes that are specific for that purpose if you have a lack of trees with cavities in them. Uh, and birds also have uh, an ability to shiver to help retain their heat. Um, they have specialized feathers that add insulation. Think of geese and ducks having downy feathers, which help... Uh, keep them keep them a lot warmer um, and they also are able to uh, physically change the shape of their feathers by, by puffing them out creating these air pockets next to their bodies which help insulate them as well so you'll see birds all puffed out in the winter that is simply to stay warm just like we're wearing a big puffy down jacket um, same idea um, but let's get back to that question at hand about how do they keep um, from freezing while bathing in cold water. And, you know, some of it has to do with those air pockets. Um, but ducks and geese in particular are an interesting um, species or group there, uh, where their veins and arteries run in close proximity to each other in their feet. So ducks' feet don't get cold because they're constantly recirculating blood, warming themselves, warming their feet in cold water. And, of course, they're always kicking around, too, so that probably helps. Um, so lots of interesting strategies to, uh, to help them preserve heat and retain heat. Um, other species uh, allow their extremities to cool down um, so, so they can preserve the vital heat near their organs. So songbirds will do that. And then finally, um, hummingbirds are an interesting case. They'll actually go into some sort of torpor at night and slow down their metabolism. So pretty interesting adaptations all across the board for keeping birds warm. And um, I'm going to transition now to talk about uh, wildlife sanctuaries a little bit. Um, oh, before I do that, let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a close. Let's go on a little walk here while we still have a bunch of you. Let's go down and check out the bird feeders. So bear with me here. Take a quick walk through my house, too. <clears throat> These are not the backyard turkeys, but of course we have some of the hens here feeding under the feeders. They just responded to an alarm call. You see how still some of these birds just got? The chickens are keyed in to what might be danger in the area. Uh, Blue Jays just gave an alarm call. Here comes a, a jay right now. So there's probably a hawk nearby that was just sighted. But, uh, but here's my feeder setup. I'll show you what we have here for bird feeders. Um, <clears throat> suet. So hanging here is a suet feeder, a suet cake, in this case, loaded with seeds and corn. A uh, great place for woodpeckers to hang out. Some of the other songbirds will, will also uh, work on the suet. This is uh, shelled sunflower, um, sunflower hearts. Uh, this is a favorite for many species of songbirds. It's an easy source. It's kind of like a lazy bird food. So I also will put it here in this tray in hopes of attracting evening grosbeaks. And we did have one yesterday, so that was super exciting. Thistle feeder. Thistle is the smallest seed here, this little black seed. It is a specialized feeder that allows the birds to pull these tiny seeds out. Hello there, chickadee. There's there are the chickadees uh, enjoying the, uh, the easy pickings on the sunflowers with no seeds. 
and then hanging black oil sunflower seeds, of course. A, uh, a favorite and kind of a, a generic food source um, for birds, but a, but a very important one at bird feeders. I'd say if you have to pick one type of bird feeder, you'll want to get a hanging feeder like this and use black oil sunflower. So, uh, so we take these in at night to keep the bears away, uh, we'll put this bird baffle up to keep the squirrels off, and that setup will work very nicely. Um, created a little temporary brush pile here too. It's good for the birds to have a little bit of cover. Um, ideally, a little bit more than we have here is, is a good scenario. So, so with that, let's see, we'll back away and see what comes in for a second here. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the mammals in this backyard too in a second. And I'll show you a few pictures from a trail camera that I set up this fall. Looks like some goldfinches are, are waiting for me to back away a little further, so I think I'll let them have their space here and let them enjoy food. Chickadees, though, it's a fun activity, especially with kids. Hold out some seeds in place of a bird feeder, and uh, chickadees will come in and land on your hand if you're patient. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Before we move away from the yard, I wanted to talk a little bit about windows. Windows are a major source of bird collisions uh, and death. So um, I'm guilty of having that issue here at our house. Um, recently though, we found a solution that we think is, is going to work and has been working well. Um, there are certain type of tape that uh, allows you to um, stick the tape across the outside and then peel back this long row of tape. It leaves tiny little dots that allow the light to get through that are really not too visually impairing from the inside at all. In fact, we've gotten quite used to it. But they're in such a pattern where there's only a two inch spacing in every direction. So birds as a result will not see the light um, or they, they won't see an opening that they could fly through because there's a window on the other side. There's plenty of light coming through this window and, um, and that can be a real challenge sometimes. And, uh, and it has the birds coming through it. So temporarily on some other windows, we've used uh, the yarn design, yarn blowing around at two inch intervals also, and that will prevent birds from flying through. So you can do that design as well. Uh, so, so yeah, we're just waiting for a warmer day to put up the rest of our tape at this point. So it sticks. Bird bath. Uh oh, it's frozen. I better thaw that out. Okay, back upstairs. All right, field trip's over. It's cold out there. Thanks for sticking with me there. I hope that worked out okay on the technology side. Um, so yeah, real quickly I want to talk about some wildlife sanctuaries in the, the remaining minutes here, and then wrap up with uh, raptors. Um, a couple of uh, great places to take a walk right now are some of the wildlife sanctuaries that New Hampshire Audubon owns and manages. Um, one that is getting a lot of attention is the Ponema Bog Sanctuary in Amherst. And this property is a, is a nice easy walk, about a three-quarter mile long uh, boardwalk trail. And um, it's, uh, it's flat for the most part, uh, a little bit of a rise to get to the bog boardwalk. Um, and before the ice especially, it's a good time to get there. Once the ice comes in, the boards become a little slippery and it's, it's really not recommended for visiting. But it's a fine time to see an open uh, Heath bog area. Let me see. Everybody still with me here? That's still working. I may have frozen. Okay, I'm going to keep going, but send a comment if you can see and hear me still, please. Uh, so Ponema Bog in Amherst, great place to visit. Um, you can see uh, um, bog plants, which are, are now um, a little bit harder to see. They're, they're not flowering now, but they're still there. Uh, great place to watch birds, too. There are some platforms that are getting some new attention. Uh, lots of great places for people to just sit and enjoy and 
take a quiet walk. And, and the place is loaded with birds and, and, uh, and interesting bog plants. Um, let's see, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the uh, raptor observatories now. We're wrapping up the hawk watch season at Pac-Manadnock tomorrow. And um, we will be ending 75 consecutive days of counting during this 16th year in a row. Um, and uh, at this point, we've seen over 12,000 migrating raptors. So we'll end right around that number. And once again, we broke the record, the season record for bald eagles. Bald eagles have been doing great each year, three years in a row. We've broken records now, and we're at 182 for the season. Um, there used to be a lot more ospreys than bald eagles when we started this hawk watch 15 years ago. Now it's the other way around. Bald eagles have overtaken ospreys. Um, they used to be outnumbered three to one, and now eagles have the lead. So ospreys have been declining. That's a species that we're, again, keeping an eye on. Uh, even though they've had some local recoveries uh, in nesting areas, um, uh, ospreys are we're seeing fewer pass by the watches now. We're also concerned about northern goshawks. These are um, these big, exciting raptors from the north that come through uh, in, in kind of cyclically, kind of like the eruptive uh, finches that I talked about. And this year we've only counted 12, uh, whereas some years we've counted up to 70. So, um, so not a great year for them. Um, however, there are some signs that they might be starting to push south now in bigger numbers. Golden eagles are always uh, a fascinating and exciting bird. And they, um, at this point, we've only seen five, I believe. So um, the average is seven. Uh, so we've only seen five. So there are a few more to come through, hopefully. But we're running out of time. So, uh, so yeah, great season at PAC. We'll have um, more of an update. Um, on the New Hampshire Audubon website at some point, so stay tuned to that. Um, and let me wrap up with uh, a few photos from my trail camera. Um, it's been uh, really exciting to get this camera set up. And let's see. Bear with me here as I get some photos going here. Yeah, so... A few exciting things have been showing up uh, over the past couple of months. We saw some immediate activity in setting up this trail camera along one of our woods trails. Um, you can see the image here showing raccoons with their glowing eyes in some cases, a little band of young raccoons. Um, this is back in September or early October, a porcupine walking through in broad daylight. We've had striped skunk, of course still on the move. Yeah, and this has been one of the real highlights this year is uh, seeing gray fox. Uh, gray fox will come out. It's a, it's a woodland species of fox that can actually climb trees. Um, and um, they're very cat-like too. This is a cat, um, which we were very alarmed to see because I never see a cat here during the day. It's important to keep those cats indoors. Um, but... Uh, yeah, gray fox. We've had two coming in. Um, I set up a little bit of a bait pile here for them one night, and they enjoyed it. They enjoyed picking apart a chicken carcass, and we got some great images of gray fox, which is a beautiful animal. Of course, white-tailed deer, which have regular trails. So you can see where they're walking through. Oh, and this is Ponema bog, as I was talking about the bog earlier. And red tail talk to end it. All right. Well, let me see if I can get to any remaining questions here. If anybody still has um, questions that I didn't get to, please remind me of those. And I'll take a quick glance at the list here. I think there was a question about juncos earlier. And um, I'm trying to get to that one here, but just scrolling back. Different variations of juncos. Um, a couple of people asked about that. Uh, well, juncos are... Um, we get one species of junco. Um, the dark-eyed junco. 
it's it's uh, common across the, the northern and central United States. Um, juncos are in the sparrow family, and there's a bird with, you know, just a quick review of what a junco is, generally a darker grayish back and a white belly. However, there are different forms, different um, races of juncos. So just a quick image here from the, uh, the Sibley Field Guide showing a plate full of dark-eyed juncos. You can see some of the brown that occurs in some of these birds. Um, this particular one is the Oregon junco, still within the dark-eyed species, but um, different, um, a different race of junco. Uh, we also have a species from the, or a, a, a race from the central part of the United States in the Rocky Mountains, uh, also a little bit darker on the head, more contrasting between the, the head and belly and back. So if you do have one that looks like that, it's possible. Oregon juncos do sometimes occur in the eastern U.S., including in New Hampshire. Um, we'd love to know about it and uh, send some photos to the naturalist um, email address. Um, New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, but generally, if you're seeing a couple of different colors of juncos, you might be seeing adult males, which have the darkest backs and, uh, and heads, um, and then some of the younger or female type birds, which have more brownish on the back um, and are just a little bit less contrasting overall um, with more brown altogether. But juncos all have that white in the outer tail that you'll see in flight. Um, so that's a quick review of some of the junco types. Uh, so any other last comments here? I'm happy to, uh, to answer just one more question maybe. And I'm taking a look through to see if there are any. Turkeys, yep, I think we covered turkeys, owls, um, certainly crossbills. Okay. Well, with that, I guess um, I will say goodbye for now. That's all the time we have. Uh, but I look forward to joining you again as the naturalist in, uh, in a future month, maybe even in December. Uh, and when I do, count on me to discuss wildlife sanctuaries, which ones to visit, um, what's going on seasonally in your own backyard, in my backyard anyway, and in uh, across the state in the world of birds. And I'm happy to answer any of your other questions about what's happening in the outside world, outside your window. So thanks for joining us, and um, thank you for supporting New Hampshire Audubon. Get out there and enjoy it.